Good morning, Children's National. Thank you. Uh, so many of you know me. I'm Joelle Simpson, the Medical Director for Emergency Preparedness here. I'm very excited um, to invite our speaker who will be talking to you today about um, the federal government's role in advancing disaster preparedness for children. Um, as you know, this is National Preparedness Month, and needless to say, recently there have been a lot of uh, sort of events that's occurred where, um, you know, especially in our role as children, as providers for children, um, understanding sort of where we sit in the landscape of caring for kids, particularly in disasters, is as important as we do in taking care of them on a day to day. So, without much further, oops, sorry, I'm going to introduce our speaker. Um, Dr. Andy Garrett is Senior Medical Advisor at the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. He is the past director and deputy chief medical officer of the National Disaster Medical System at HHS. You'll hear more about that program in a bit. And he is board certified in pediatrics and emergency medical services and has broad experience as a medical director for fire, EMS, and law enforcement agencies. He completed a two-year fellowship in EMS and law enforcement, sorry, a two-year fellowship in EMS and disaster medicine and received an MPH from the University of Massachusetts in 2006. He has adjunct faculty appointments at the Uniformed Services, University of Health Sciences, NYU, and GW. And he just returned to HHS after completing the White House Leadership Development Program Fellowship and then continuing on at the White House for a year-long detail as a Director for Medical and Biodefense Preparedness Policy at the National Security Council. Ooh, uh, a lot. <laughs> Sorry, that even caught me off guard. Um, his past clinical experiences include serving as an attending physician in pediatric emergency medicine in, in Worcester. Worcester. I knew that. I, I trained in Massachusetts as well. I knew I was going to get that wrong. Massachusetts, and three years as a pediatric transport medicine attending physician at LA Children's Hospital. His disaster fieldwork includes, but is not limited, to deployment to the Haiti earthquake in 2010, the Joplin tornado in 2011, the Deepwater Horizon environmental disaster in 2010, Hurricane Katrina, the 2006 Nice Island earthquake in Indonesia, on board the USNS Mercy Hospital ship, Superstorm Sandy, and most recently, Hurricane Irma. His publications include Children and Mega Disasters, Lessons Learned in the New Millennium, Public Health Disaster Research, Surveying the Field, Defining Its Future, and Mitigating Absenteeism in Hospital Workers During a Pandemic. I am so excited to have you come speak with us today. Um, and so, here's Dr. Andy Garrett. Good morning, and what a pleasure to be here in the Children's Hospital. Thank you, Joelle. You guys are so lucky to have her on the job. Uh, one amazing colleague, and, and she's doing such important work. And uh, as, as hopefully you'll walk away with uh, the appreciation that, that it's so important what you guys are doing as individuals, as hospitals here locally, and that informs preparedness for the whole system. So, uh, yeah, those, that was three articles, by the way. That wasn't like one long article. <laughs> uh, and Worcester's not where they make the sauce. Um, it's like a Gallagher concert. Nobody's sitting up front. So nobody knows what that is. That's the guy who used to smash the watermelons and everybody get watermelon on. Anyway, without any further ado, we're going to talk about the federal government's role in supporting uh, disaster preparedness overall. My, my understanding from talking with Joel is that over the past two years, those of you that have been here for two years, you heard about this perspective from the uh, perspective of the AAP and from the perspective of local hospital-based preparedness. So hopefully this is the trifecta. For those of you that have been here for three years, and I appreciate from looking at the crowd that maybe not all of you have. Uh, I see a lot of house staff here too, which is great. And thank you guys for coming. I understand you are uh, at high census right now, and uh, he's resident in Philadelphia. I know what that means. I know what your life is right now. So I will uh, I will give you a little overview here, so you can plan your naps and note taking. Uh, I mean, patient note taking for, your, for writing your charts. I guess you don't do those on paper anymore. Sorry. <laughs> Um, we're going to talk about the government's approach to disaster preparedness response and recovery. We're going to talk a little bit about the evolution of pediatric disaster preparedness. I'm a Fed, so we've got to talk about alphabet soup and some of the different agencies and departments and what we do. And I'm going to keep foot stomping the importance of hyperlocal preparedness. Okay, standard disclaimer. There we go. I'm also going to disclaim that uh, I, I sort of shamelessly plagiarize good pictures and things along the way. Uh, for brevity, I don't put references in here. If you really want to know the source of a picture I used, um, come see me afterwards. Uh, 
patient, patient pictures are either public domain or with permission. That is really important. We don't just sneak patient pictures and throw them on there. So this is hopefully a pretty timely talk. Uh, it's been an, an interesting past couple of weeks uh, for us in the emergency response business. Uh, this is certainly an ongoing situation with the very dynamic uh, disaster that continues to unfold in Puerto Rico. Uh, and we'll, we'll certainly, this will be one for the record books 2017 for really how many, how many big disasters we have sort of back to back to back. And literally the first one started about a week after our new Assistant Secretary for Preparedness Response took, uh, took the seat. So it's sort of the baptismal by fire tradition that we've always had. I, I went to Haiti within a, within five days of being uh, uh, selected as the Deputy Chief Medical Officer for I literally hadn't even moved into my office yet and I was on a plane to Haiti. So let's organize our approach. When we talk about disasters, you know, old, old dogma is linear, right? There's before the disaster, there's the disaster, and there's after the disaster. And, and like many processes, we realize that this is actually a linear type of a thing. So you have mitigation and preparation that precedes an, that precedes an event. You've got response and recovery that happens after it. But really, I want just as we're thinking about it and talking about it, and as I'm explaining the government's approach to it, we really look at it as more of a continuum. So response and recovery really just leads right into mitigation preparedness for the next event. So this sort of cyclical disaster life cycle or disaster management cycle is, is the basis for our discussion here. Uh, FEMA, as the lead federal uh, coordinating agency for disasters for the federal government, and when we say coordinating, we always mean in, in the government we have to have an abbreviation, so we call it SLTT, State, Local, Tribal, and Territorial. So FEMA is the lead federal point of contact uh, and coordinating body for SLTT uh, coordination. Really what we've seen is they take a framework approach, and I'll talk about what that means a little bit more in a second, but what started as a plan really has evolved into a framework because they realized that the plan was a little bit too uh, structured for how disasters really go, and case in point, Hurricane Katrina. It's great to have a plan, but really when the plan doesn't go as planned right up front, then really you kind of derail the whole process. We've evolved to a framework approach where you look at what capabilities you need to have out there. You look at a system of guiding response that is not just applicable to the federal government, it's applicable to all stakeholders, state, local, tribal, territorial, and federal, and it's always on. So instead of that box with bullhorns and decontamination equipment that we used to keep under the desk in the emergency room and pull out and maybe the flashlight worked if you need it, this is stuff you're using every day. So the framework and the concepts of the, of the framework for the uh, response is, is always on, this sort of living document that uh, it, it guides how the state's local te tribal territorial authorities and the federal government are going to work together. The other major part of this transition as they worked into this framework approach was uh, Administrator Craig Fugate from FEMA really game changed things right around Katrina uh, and afterwards where instead of sort of seeing propagating a model where there was a crisis and you lie down and you call for help and you wait for someone to come help you, sort of like EMS in our country has been over decades. If you get hurt, just call 911, lie down, and wait for someone to come help you. That, that tide is changing a little bit right now, too. You'll see sort of this we are all first responders mentality that's infiltrating its way into EMS, which is a good thing. Um, but Craig Fugate really got into this whole community approach, meaning you can't just take care of the adults because they're the easy <laughs> ones and then put pediatrics into the annex later. Or in EMS education, I always call it Chapter 21 syndrome. Like you have this whole book on EMS. And then there's obstetrical emergencies and pediatric emergencies at the last two chapters at the end. And everybody freaks out because it's all in milligrams per kilogram. And, oh, my God, it's going to – and we have this mentality that if you don't do it right, everyone's going to die. Uh, you know, kids aren't just little adults. Um, but really, when you think about the process-wise, we're a community. Kids are part of that community. People with disabilities are part of that community. People that speak languages that aren't the one you speak are part of that community. So FEMA's approach was we plan for the whole community, not just chunks of it. Uh, their other sort of philosophical change was we plan for survivors, not victims. So sounds subtle, but it's really important. You know, you survive the disaster. You're not, again, you're not someone who's waiting for assistance as the only op option to get from point A to point B. And we are all first responders. It's sort of self-explanatory. So the framework approach really started with the national uh, response framework and has expanded now into other areas of that disaster life cycle. Now you notice they don't call it preparedness here. There's prevention, protection, and mitigation, which a little bit fuzzy, but it's all sort of that pre-disaster part response. And now recovery is certainly something that has, has come to the forefront as one of the most critical parts of, of 
response, actually. And we start thinking about recovery at the same time we start thinking about response. And that's a relatively new phenomenon. It was always happening. Recovery always happens after disaster. But I think in the past, the federal government's role was really how do we intercede during the uh, license irons, burning buildings, uh, handing out checks part of it. And, and now it's really a continuum. For, for major disasters, we will stay engaged from the recovery standpoint for years and years afterwards uh, to assist communities. Let's paint a little historical context here. So uh, I think we appreciate that disasters have been around for a while, but certainly I think as we all started thinking about Y2K, which was the new millennium and, the, and what, does, what does that gonna bring in terms of a disaster, the government was really focused on natural disasters. How can we really tee up to think about the hurricane situation and the earthquake situation and the, uh, you know, what's gonna happen when there's a major earthquake in, in the Midwest and that type of thing. And then 9-11 happened. 9-11 was not a natural disaster. It required a whole different set of resources. And really, it was a little bit like eight-year-olds playing soccer where everybody kind of ran to the new terrorism thing. And we spent a lot of time after 9-11 really thinking about how do we respond to terrorism and detect terrorism. And then what happened in 2005? Hurricane Katrina, uh, the tsunami, we all of a sudden realized that you know, Mother Nature didn't like being neglected and uh, declared herself again. So then we, it, in many ways, had to sort of run back and it exposed some of the liabilities in the, in the planning processes that, that happened there. So we got off, we got off to a rough millennium. Uh, I think there's no, there's no question about that with uh, everything we saw internationally and nationally. And we certainly appreciate that Hurricane Katrina the tsunami, and to some extent, the, the 2009 pandemic flu, I, I underlined it in bold, exposed disproportional biopsychosocial risk that children face in disasters, because that's really, that is, if that's the only thing you take out of today, I'll be really happy, because we just want to appreciate that kids, the experience that kids have in a disaster and the experience that adults have in a disaster may be fundamentally different, even if the hazard's the same and even if the environment's the same, just because of the nature of who they are. We could do a whole grand rounds or we could do a whole course on uh, how kids are different during disasters, and that's, that's worth talking about. But, uh, you know, psychologically, socially, physically, there's so much about kids that makes them a, just a little different beast during a disaster that you have to think differently about. Uh, it doesn't have to break your system, but you have, to, you have to understand and acknowledge that it's there. And that's a disaster thing. That's an EMS thing. That's, uh, that's a medical care thing across the board. So uh, anybody in the house staff know what that picture is on the bottom? Any thoughts? Throw it out. Come on. I don't have – yes, Anthrax. Who said that? Yeah, that's Anthrax. Um, so that coal black SR of Anthrax. So does anybody know where this picture is taken from? So the kid who was in the studios during the anthrax attack, the Amerithrax attack in, in after 9-11, uh, this sort of makes the point because how do you get a kid with anthrax during an attack that was targeted at a media outlet? Probably kid came to work. Where do kids go? Kids go on the floor. What do kids do? Get on the floor. They put stuff in their mouth. They're rolling around. So this kid somehow got that on his arm. And, you know, kids immunologically have different responses than adults too. So this is just started to make the point, a child in, a, in an adult situation may have a very different experience and was one of the, the cases of anthrax from 2001. And then I was talking about biopsychosocial, not gonna really dive in there, but that's a neat way of thinking about kids in pretty much any situation as a clinician. I really embraced it, even though I didn't go to the University of Rochester, they sort of pioneered this, looking at the whole care of a child through different lenses that exist simultaneously, biopsycho and social. But we also have to appreciate that kids play a very specific role in our society. So they're, the 25% the of our population is kids under 18. And we as the other 75% have a very unique relationship with that 25%. Um, and you know, the point here with this slide is that as we think about preparedness and building preparedness systems, one of the challenges is if we don't think about the care of children, that will hamstring the entire operation. So. I don't know if there's any parents in the room. I suspect there are, but uh, I know if my kid was one of the people on TV and I saw that going on right now, you wouldn't see me here very long. And even if the planning message was that we're going to keep your kids in an emergency, we're going to take them off site, and we're going to arrange for a bus to get them home, you know what's going to happen is every single parent is going to go find their kid. And it's just pediatric issues break preparedness systems, uh, whether it's a decon, whether it's planning for a school disaster, whether it's anything. And it's, it's, Crushing. I've been looking at this picture for one on the on your left is the Murrah Federal Building bombing, and that's 
unfortunately, the deceased child, and then the, the Sandy Hook uh, Connecticut schools. But it's just, it's hard even looking at these now as a parent, it breaks me. And to, to think about what that would involve uh, socially for me personally, if my kid was involved or somebody I knew, it's, uh, there, there would be no rules. So kids play this very unique role in our society and they deserve some special attention when we look at preparedness. And pets do too. We learned that after Katrina, right? So we learned that there's actually more than one person who will stay in their home and drown if we don't take care of their pets uh, and have a plan for them. And uh, they actually got their own law in 2006, got the Pet Evacuation and Transportation Standards Act that says the director of FEMA shall make sure that there's accommodations and plans for pets, not just service animals, pets. My guinea pig qualifies for this. Meg. Um, so, and I, I don't mean this as a, as a jab, I'm just meaning it as a for real. We, we can appreciate as a government that there are factors that we need to plan for and sometimes we'll make policy to accommodate that. Pets was one of those. Um, Post-Katrina Emergency Reform Act, or Emergency Management Reform Act, or PERMRA, uh, there's, there were nearly 50 recommendations that happened in the year after Katrina that were thou shalt for FEMA to do things differently. Uh, so there was this after action period for Hurricane Katrina, which, you know, by a lot of definitions didn't go as well as it could. Um, that wasn't just a uniquely federal challenge, but across the board. But there were opportunities for improvement in the federal government in a lot of ways. And there were 50 major recommendations there. I'm pointing this out because there was really only one that pertained to pediatrics, and that was reunification of missing children. There were over 5,000 children reported as being separated from their caregivers uh, after Hurricane Katrina. That number was actually validated at more like 163, uh, and actually all of them were reunited. Uh, it did, however, take six months to get the last ones reunited, most of them up front. But, uh, you know, the, the policies and the actions sometimes reflect the politics, and the politics can be driven by lots of signs on walls saying, where's my kid? Um, this is a very important issue. Uh, it's not necessarily the only important issue as we move forward. And fortunately, this, uh, this was recognized, and I'll get to that in one second. The Pandemic All Hazards Preparedness Act was passed in 2006. It created the Assistant Secretariat for Preparedness Response, where I've been working since 2010. It amended the existing law, which is the Public Health Service Act, created the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, and it, it expanded the authorities to really build what was going to be a leadership center for public health and uh, medical uh, disaster everything moving forward. And that was actually reauthorized in 2013 and will uh, hopefully be reauthorized again in the coming years here. So that was sort of a major health side landmark event after Hurricane uh, Katrina in 2005. Really want to spend some time on the National Commission for Children and Disasters. Uh, really, really important to acknowledge the role that this played in 2007, which was the administration brought together true experts from across multiple fields. We had physicians and pre-hospital folks and fire chiefs and uh, uh, behavioral health folks that, that got in the room. Uh, really honored to have Mike Anderson, who's one of the commissioners uh, on the NCCD here in the audience today. Just happened to be in town. We're colleagues. We're friends from working together since 2007. And uh, Mike, keep me legal on this, okay? So we're going we're gonna to hit, we're gonna hit, we're gonna hit three years' worth of material in two slides. So casualties will be sustained. But uh, the important work of the National Commission was just can't be, can't be emphasized enough. They really focused in their report on about 11 really big functional areas. I'm just going to hit them. I hate to enlist, but it's important because this is what we really identified as the major gaps and areas for improvement uh, as we look at the federal role in, in, in disaster preparedness. So management and recovery, and this is the point I made earlier, right? It's the, the role for authorities doesn't stop when the hurricane passes or when the ground shaking stops. It's really when the work's just begun. And certainly we'll see, you know, we saw in Katrina that that, that effort goes on for years and years and years and still isn't over. So they wanted to highlight that disaster management recovery is a process that, number one, can't be rushed and needs to be sort of comprehensively wrapped into the response and recovery world. And I think we've seen that culture change now, as I mentioned before. Recovery is really integral to response now. You, very, you rarely hear one without the other. Mental health. We certainly know over and over from all these incidents that mental health needs to be integrated in the overall strategy to care for kids after a disaster. We know that kids don't necessarily present with mental health and behavioral health problems the same way that adults do. They're not going to necessarily 
you know, respond to the screening exam. They're not going to sit down and say, gee, I just feel sad and I'm not finding pleasure in things that used to make me happy, doctor. Um, they, they may have school problems. They may be constipated. They may be sick to their stomach or a whole range of things. And that could just fold back into anxiety uh, or depression disorder. But as an example, like almost 30% of children in New York City, grades 4 to 12, had symptoms six months after 9-11 tying back to depressive or anxiety-related disorders. Uh, we also importantly saw after 9-11 there was no psychological ground zero, whereas in a disaster where something blows up, we tend to see a physical ground zero, so the blindings, the broken legs, the skin injuries, the burns tend to be proximal to the hazard and then diminish as you go out. We didn't see that as much in what we call the sort of psychological ground zero. People who were in the area where this happened or who were involved in hearing about it on television, pretty much everyone, remember how 9-11 just played over and over and over? Think about a kid watching that. Think about a kid just seeing that over and over and over. The ground zero was very dispersed for that. So we certainly saw from the New York surveys that, that like a third of kids really were struggling after six months. Uh, people have got it in Hurricane Katrina too. So 15% had uh, symptoms related to depressive or anxiety disorders, and that's twice the uh, prevalence of, of those conditions in the, in the rest of the population in the United States. Child physical health and trauma, and really it's about equity there. It's about making sure and this is something we've been talking about in EMS for 30 years, about making sure that when you put a kid in the back of the ambulance, they've got the right size uh, O2 mask, they've got the right size defibrillator pads, they've got the right stuff to be able to make sure that they can get the equivalent care that an adult can get when they access 911. Same thing for overall status of, of kids receiving disaster medical care. So many kids, I mean, many kids receive a care at specialty facilities like this, but during a disaster, that's probably a luxury that we're not going to have, that kids can be seen at specific pediatric centers. When you get out into the general population of uh, healthcare facilities, they don't do quite as good a job as the pediatric facilities do at pediatric preparedness for even everyday emergencies, much less disasters and surge events. So it may be an extreme challenge uh, ensuring that kids get equitable care when they access the system in different ways. Does that make sense? So. Uh, Looking at that has, uh, has been a, a big issue, especially around the issue of medical countermeasures. And when I say medical countermeasures, I mean things that you need in large quantities after a disaster that involves a hazard that you can treat or that requires treatment. So maybe doxycycline or ciprofloxacin after an anthrax attack, maybe ventilators during a pandemic flu, maybe it's uh, masks and PPE, that type of thing after, after an infectious disease incident. So, we want to make sure that there's equity in, in the ability of kids to access those types of things. EMS and transport kind of already precluded their uh, precursor to that, which was uh, they did recommend a lead federal agency for EMS. There is a federal belly button for EMS that's been there for decades at the National Highway Traffic Safety uh, Administration. Uh, that's the federal home right now for EMS. I think they envisioned a little bit uh, a more medical home as opposed to a traffic uh, highway safety bend of that, but when you look at the roots of EMS as really coming out of highway safe, highway traffic and safety uh, back in the 70s, it made sense for that home to be at NHTSA. Um, the advice of the commission was maybe it's time to think about having that be more at a response agency, um, and, and that has not been realized, but uh, NHTSA does a terrific job, and they've got terrific leadership now. They've got a, uh, a physician EMS specialist over there who's, who's really great and uh, is, is embracing the opportunity to do that with NISA and collaborate with, uh, with all of us through the interagency. Disaster case management, so capable coordinated systems for following and transfer, transitioning children throughout recovery. Look at the importance of that for something like Zika, right? Zika's a disaster for children. You gotta make sure that you get the message out to families, people not, not just kids, but families of people with kids, families more importantly of people thinking of having kids, kids that are born during Zika have, having to make sure they're in registries and followed so you can make sure that the communities are getting the right resources moving forward. Back when we didn't know how deep the pool was on Zika, we didn't know how big of an ask this was going to be. Um, and I, I think in some sense we still don't because it's got a lot of question marks. Um, but it's a good example sort of of the need to think about the specific needs of children in a complex public health emergency or disaster like that. So. The, the, the potential for needing to follow literally thousands of children for many, many years to make sure that, uh, that they get the right care they need. And then child care, elementary and secondary education, welfare and the juvenile justice system sort of are three of the same. And really what we're talking about is where are kids when they're not at home? They're most likely in school. Schools have done sort of an inconsistent job 
in making sure that they have adequate plans in place to care for our kids after a disaster. Most of them do fire drills. Most of them have really gained sophistication in the last 10 years about that with lockdown drills and evacuation plans. And I, I promise I was the worst thorn in their butt for my kids' school because the other one's always asking, it's like, oh, where's your weather radio? <laughs> or, you know, what, what, what's your plan? And, you know, these, these types of things actually can work when there's good plans for them. I think about my kids' school last fall. We had a tornado warning that was very specifically for a wedge that happened to overlap both my kid, my kids' Montessori school and my kids' elementary school, and two very different approaches. Uh, you know, we got, a, we, got a, we got a message from the elementary school that said, hey, we, we told kids we were practicing something. We put them all out in the hallway, and it worked great. We didn't really tell what was going on. The Montessori school sent, sent texts right away and said, hey, just letting you know, this is what happened. The weather radio went off. We did this. We have your kids. We're safe. We'll report back as soon as we're done. And they were, they were amazing at it. And I don't think that would have happened very much uh, five, ten years ago when this, this emphasis through collaboration with the Department of Education to make sure that schools appreciate the important, important role they have in keeping children safe and secure and as the temporary custodian uh, to, to be my kid's parent when I'm not there. Um, I'm going to keep moving. We, we could talk for a long time on, on any of those. And uh, housing, certainly, you know, look at Katrina. We had almost 200,000 kids displaced, and, and the need to get kids back into stable housing as quickly as possible. It doesn't necessarily need to be their old house, just needs to be safe, stable housing. Uh, and then to, uh, to, to pair that with getting kids back to school as soon as possible uh, really are, are of the utmost importance when we're trying to get a child back on track for recovery after a disaster. Having kids sitting at home watching stuff over and over on TV for two, three, four weeks doesn't help them. They need to be back in. I'll digress for a short story where I got uh, the privilege of deploying out with the, the Navy hospital ship, the Mercy, down to uh, Indonesia after the earthquake that happened after the Indian Ocean tsunami. And we really came in to provide all of the medical care to a community that was absolutely leveled uh, by a major, major earthquake. It wasn't so much a tsunami this time, but the resources were already depleted in Indonesia. And then this horrible follow-on aftershock to the earthquake that had happened near Christmas in 2004. This was about three or four months later. Uh, four months later. You know, one of the things that really struck me was even though we were there on day three or four, coming in and still bringing in acute medical services, and we were there with tents from almost every country you could imagine, one of the things that really struck me as we were walking through the community is that kids were in uniform at their school, going to school, sitting on the rubble of their school. The teachers were standing on rubble. The kids were sitting on the rubble. I mean, granted, we could never do that in the United States with uh, some of the laws we have in place to protect the uh, uh, work sites. But the point taken, people were sitting on their collapsed school, going to school on day four in uniform. And they weren't all there because they were casualties. But the ones that were there were in school. That's critically important. I don't know if it needs to go quite to that extreme, but the philosophy of getting kids back to school can't emphasize that enough. Lastly, evacuation, ensuring that everyone has a fair chance to get out of harm's way. This was especially poignant after New Orleans and Katrina, you'll remember, because there was inequitable access to public transportation, vehicles, and ways to get out of Dodge. Uh, so when we flooded, when the town was flooded, uh, there were folks that really didn't have that opportunity to get out of harm's way. So the commission really foot stomped that as a, as, as a priority. And part of that was child reunification. So I think this is a really good quote. I'm, I don't know if Mike wrote this, but one year ago, the commission offered a sobering assessment of the national state of disaster and emergency preparedness for children. As expected, we found seriously deficiencies in each functional area where children were more often an afterthought than a priority. And it's important to note that this was not done maliciously. Nobody in preparedness in the federal government or anywhere else did this maliciously. Preparedness is a big, hairy, complex, expensive problem. And like a lot of problems in medicine, they were tailored, and I keep going back to EMS because that's where I spent a lot of my time. EMS was really born out of the, the conflicts of the Vietnam War and Korean War where we needed systems to take care of sick and hurt adults, and that was translated into how we took care of people in the United States. Kids were really an afterthought to EMS, right? So we built a system to transport sick adults and then made smaller versions of the big things to take care of kids because you just make one that's half the size and that solves the problem. So that's that's an approach that has sort of pervaded itself into disaster response as well. But I think now the important work that's happened in the last 15 years has really uh, 
led for a much more sophisticated approach towards how this is going to go uh, moving forward. So even before the commission had produced this report, FEMA really snaps too. And it's not like the commission was off in a private room by itself. We were there every meeting as the government. It was sort of an interesting situation for me because I was actually not a government official during all but the last three months of the National Commission. Uh, so I was, I was a child advocate working at Columbia University's public health school, uh, given the commission and the government folks a, a pretty hard time, along with some of my colleagues, for why we need to do this stuff. And then uh, bullet number two is yours truly. And then when I took my government job, then my job was now, after the report came out, to answer some of the same stuff that I wrote uh, now as the government guy. So, you know, no, no good deed goes un uh, unrecognized. So it, it was a really neat time, though, because the government really did anticipate and was eager to work with the commission to get this sort of collaborative group think approach towards what do we need to do to take care of children better in disasters. So uh, I'll talk about some of the things that, that FEMA did, some of the things that HHS did here real quick. So right out the gate, FEMA had already, by the time the, by the, time the ink had dried, they'd already had a couple early wins on this. They'd released pediatric sheltering requirements that is a publicly available document now for shelter planners, whether you're private, public, church-based, anything, you can get for free documents that are consensus derived that says, here's what you need to think about. It's not just water and MREs, meals ready to eat. You need to think about diapers and formula and hand sanitizers and things like that. It sounds simple, but sometimes having a, a planning document in your hand can really reap big rewards. Uh, what's called a NEC, like the National Emergency Child Locator Center was stood up in, in conjunction with NECMEC, which is the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Uh, and now I'm putting that website on there because you can go Google this. There's a live website now that you can use. I'm sure folks have used that in the emergency room here. If you have someone to show up that's unaccompanied, you can actually drop in a, a request and they're all handled the same process, uh, whether it's a disaster, whether it's an emergency room, or whether it's a law enforcement station in New Mexico that finds an unaccompanied child. They're all done the same way now. Uh, feel free to log on there. Just as the responder, you have to put the word test or the reporter, just put the word test, but you can follow reports. Just use the word test if you want to play with this a little bit. I encourage you to do so. Again, tools that you pull out only during a disaster aren't really reliable tools. Make sure you know how to use this stuff. Make sure you know the batteries are, work, are good in the flashlight. Um, some of the other quick wins there, the crisis counseling program uh, in good collaboration with uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration at HHS or SAMHSA, uh, they rolled out quickly child counseling uh, opportunities and included uh, reimbursement and grant support for child coordinators uh, when, when requests are made to activate those programs. They stood up a disaster, disaster distress helpline that is the same disaster distress helpline that's online today for the hurricanes. The number's the same. It's, they scale it up and down in terms of staffing, but what it does is provide immediate crisis counseling because we recognized before that this is an important issue. Um, child care services uh, being available through FEMA individual assistance. So encouraging people who are applying through for FEMA assistance to think about uh, the importance of childcare so people can get back to school, to get back to work. Um, some of the other stuff that's really important was the messaging strategy through ready.gov. Very family-centric, very whole community-centric. Uh, other things like FEMA's Youth Preparedness Council. This is all really good stuff that happened in the first coming months after the report came out because they anticipated where it was going to go. So we'll switch from FEMA over to HHS a little bit. Um, you know, this is really when I just first showed up being a Fed, so I was involved in, in quite a bit of this. So stuff we did right out, the, right out the gate, acknowledging all this importance. So increasing the amount of purposeful preparedness, and purposeful preparedness is a term that I've kind of coined to counteract the random acts of preparedness, which is a term that uh, Erwin Redliner, who we've worked with for years, coined after 9-11. And random acts of preparedness are when people want to do the right thing and you either throw money or policy at a, pro at a problem uh, and you don't necessarily coordinate it as well as you could. It's, it's done with good intentions, but it's not reaping the maximum benefits because it's not necessarily coordinated as well as it could be. So we really want to think about purposeful preparedness. So purposeful preparedness, in my mind, means something working towards a, a shared and uh, um, validated goal. Some of the things that HHS did right off the bat to respond to the report, they improved their coordination with stakeholders such as the American Academy of Pediatrics and the DPAC, the Disaster Preparedness Advisory Committee, and these guys were just there uh, at the twice annual meeting for the uh, NCE in Chicago. I was supposed to be there, I missed it because I was down in Florida, but uh, they're gonna tell me all about it. Um, HHS established the Children's Interagency Leadership on Disasters Working Group, which is actually a fairly big deal. It's called the Child Group. But it was interagency, so HHS is a big place with hundreds of thousands of employees, and as you'll see later, many, many operating and staff divisions. Coordinating just within HHS is a major effort, 
uh, this, was an, this was an effort to get all the major departments and agencies together so that they had one place that we were setting our priorities and common goals for uh, uh, child-related leadership for disaster. They established a pediatric obstetrics called IPT, or an integrated program team, to support the FEMC, which is the Public Health Emergency Medical Countermeasures Enterprise. FEMC exists to make sure that the right medical countermeasures are available to the right audience at the right time. Having solid pediatric input to that process is critical. So we don't do what we talked about before, where you solve the problem for the grown-ups and then have to figure out a patchwork solution to get the kids control, uh, get the kids taken care of. So the pediatric OB IPT, um, I'm just taking over now as the chair of that, now that I'm back, and uh, this a really important group that, that's gonna that focus on making sure the FEMC's good work is, uh, is appropriately embracing kids' needs. Uh, CDC did a lot of amazing stuff too. They launched the Child Preparedness Unit and they have some really true national experts down there. And they really looked at how they do their emergency operations as well. And they have a children's health team integrated into their baseline uh, capacities for emergency operations down there. So I'll throw some pictures up. So as the, at the time I was the Deputy Chief Medical Officer and subsequently the Director for the National Disaster Medical System, a group of uh, around 6,000 doctors, nurses, paramedics, command and control staff organized into about 100 response teams around the country. All of our employees are intermittent federal employees, which means that when we deploy folks like we've done several thousand times in the past couple of weeks here, uh, when we deploy disaster medical assistance teams, um, which is the sort of the, the common denominator team we put out in the field, when we deploy these folks, yes, you get a federal salary. It's probably not as much as you make on, the, on your day job, but we try. Um, more importantly, coverage for medical liability, tort claim, workers' comp, that kind of stuff is really important, and it's those little things that have really hamstringed medical volunteerism in the United States because it's tough to just pick up from your hospital and go down and work at Hurricane Katrina because, you know, if you happen to get sued two years later when people aren't as in the moment, uh, and we've certainly seen this happen over and over, you got to make sure you got the right coverage and liability protection so you don't, you know, lose your house, that type of thing. So it's important to make sure your employees and responders are taken care of. But Anyway, that's about NDMS. One of the things that we did was in our integrated training program where we have people go down to Anniston, Alabama every couple of years for integrated training down there, um, we really upped our game in terms of scenario-based training using uh, low and high fidelity simulators. Um, uh, we work with the team down there. They have amazing actors in the community. They have 200 actors in the community that routinely come in and get moulaged up and stress the system. And basically what we do is we send everybody down there, give them iPads, and do didactic classroom training for a couple days. And then we set up field hospitals, and we take down the field hospital, we set up the field hospital in a different way, and then we start running patients through there. And on the last day, there's a capstone exercise. And I took this picture because this young lady in a hospital gown with a very large pillow stuffed under her belt also has a two-liter bottle of water under her thing. And she walked into the command and control tent. This is guys with radios and the commander and all the whiteboards, not the medical tent. She's like, I think I'm having a baby, at which point she breaks her water and lies down on the floor. And this, has, this is our logistics chief for the exercise, full-scale exercise. This is our logistics chief who happened to be paramedic and delivered the baby. No big deal. So delivered the baby, move, with, get every, move everybody over to the tent, get everybody taken care of. But working with the, the capabilities of the Center for Domestic Preparedness down there, they have uh, very sophisticated simu – I can't say that word – stimulationists, I think, is the, is the term to, to – uh, simulate everything from uh, traumatic amputations with literally fake flood spraying all over the tent, all over in everybody's face. There's no, there's no substitution for that. You can, you can pretend and put a three by five card on that says this leg is amputated, or you can bring in uh, Stumpy Joe, who's literally bleeding all over the tent. And if you don't know where your tourniquets are and you don't know where your stuff is, you're gonna have a really bad day. Even though it's fake, I guarantee you people's pulse rates are 180 in that room. Um, so a lot of that kind of stuff, complicated kids coming in, and that was honestly the first time I'd seen a simulator that wasn't white. So I really appreciated that they have simulators that actually look like people we treat in disasters. So there's not just white adults. So that, I think that's really neat. So we really upped our game in terms of how we build these standardized scenarios in, and we use the same scenarios every time we rotate teams down there so that we can compare apples to apples to apples moving forward. A lot of other interesting stuff happened. I included these because one of the other important stuff is sort of how do we train as a system for behavioral health emergencies. So they do a great job down there of bringing in actors that uh, play different roles. <laughs> Literally, you're, you're in operations and a guy in a Superman cape and tie-dye shows up. And 
you know, it's just a stressor, but it's real world. That's the kind of stuff that happens when you open a medical facility in Brooklyn uh, for two weeks during Superstorm Sandy. This kind of stuff happens. You guys show up. So training our people to, to train as they fight. One of the other great things that happened was uh, sort of part two of the continuum of the National Commission was the National Advisory Council on Children's Disaster. And I'm just giving Mike a hard time because he was the chair for this group and it really started started and did some, it's a screen grab, give me some credit. Uh, so for, for those on the WebEx, Michael Anderson's cringing a little bit right now and I'm probably gonna pay for this afterwards. But uh, it, all kidding aside, the National Advisory Council on Children's Disaster played a very important role, brought together to advise the Secretary of Health and the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness Response as we move forward, so now what's the continuation of the work the commission did? How do we continue moving forward and continue to tackle these problems? Because clearly, even from the recommendations of the commission, we've made great progress, but we're not necessarily done, per se. So I really want to acknowledge and thank Mike for his leadership as a commissioner on the National Commission, but also then as the chair on the, on the subsequent group as well. And uh, It's really neat that you came to, to join us here today, and hopefully you'll be around to do questions and answers with me, because you got, uh, you got expertise that I do not. Managing disasters, I'm gonna to have to go fast here because we're gonna run out of time. I, I promise that was long-winded. So FEMA is the overall coordinator. The national, frame, the national response framework, as we talked about, has annexes, has a lot of annexes. The one you're gonna hear about the most is emergency support function eight, which is health and medical. There's other ones for electricity and agriculture and fire, and we're gonna talk about eight. So HHS is the lead for, for ESF eight. These are the types of things we do. Everything from patient and animal care to vector control and definitive care for, for medical. HHS, as I mentioned, is a really big place. These are all, these are not all. These are some of the major operating and staff divisions. I'm going to dive in a little bit. Assistant Secretary for Preparedness Response, this is the alphabet soup part of the uh, agenda. So ASPR, created during the Pandemic All Hazard Preparedness Act, hosts the National Disaster Medical System, the program I was with. The belly button for the Medical Reserve Corps, uh, more on that in a little bit. At MRC has a federal belly button, but it's not a federal program per se. Also, you've probably heard about the Hospital Preparedness Program, which uh, is a program that's designed to support coalition building around uh, hospital and healthcare preparedness. Other words that you might have heard in the past are BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Research Development Authority. That's the medical countermeasures and uh, it's essentially development uh, process uh, to, to come up with products that then go into the medical countermeasures development uh, system. Uh, our at-risk individual system uh, called ABC, at-risk individuals, behavioral health, and community resilience. They engage on a lot of the, uh, of how we're making sure that ASPR is engaged on things like behavioral health and support to the human services side, not necessarily the health side. Also something I just want to point out, the resource of Tracy. So, um, all right, that's the picture of Tracy, because I was talking about Tracy, Medical Reserve Corps and NDMS, but I wanted to just mention this. So, this is the type of work that we do at ASPR. So things like patient movement, working closely with the Department of Defense. Uh, that's a scene from a typical DMAT tent. This is a picture from three or four weeks ago going down to Hurricane Irma with uh, several DMAT uh, teams and some US Public Health Service folks in the back of C-130 getting transported down. So interesting and very exciting work. Office of Assistant Secretary of Health, another area at HHS, is the home of the US Public Health Service. This uh, public health service is an important fighting force for disaster response and everyday health care in the United States. So it's one of the uniformed services, it's an unarmed uniformed service, but, uh, but it is one of the absolute uniformed services. They use the same rank as the U.S. Navy, and uh, uh, 6,000 are so strong, all officers, many of them uh, medical. They bring uh, assets such as uh, general medical teams, they can staff shelters, they can provide behavioral health specialty uh, strike teams, they can provide service access teams, which is case management. Um, and really over the last 10 years or so, we've really seen PHS deploying alongside of NDMS in almost every situation where we go out in the field. Other areas, and we're going fast here, but just to get an appreciation of it, just so you've heard the words and you have the association. Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, Medicare, Medicaid Services. You've maybe heard about the rule, I know you've also heard about the rule. Um, so in the preparedness world, there's carrots and there's sticks. This is a stick. Uh, this is CMS saying that if you want to be reimbursed the, for your CMS type of patients, you need to meet certain requirements in your facility to make sure that preparedness is a priority. Um, it's admittedly a stick. It was done with the intent of being a stick and sticks are actually kind of good in this world sometimes. Think about seatbelt enforcement. You can tell people all day long that it's really good to wear seatbelts. What made people wear seatbelts? I can write you a $35 ticket if you're not wearing seatbelts. So 
ERSA, the Health Resources and Services Administration, Home for the EMS for Children program, very important program that's been around for a long time. Their goal is to establish a strong baseline for emergency care for children, not just EMS, but emergency care defined broadly in the United States. And that comes along with the capability to surge during a disaster. So it's ensuring that what you can do on game day is what you can do every day. So looking at things like equipment, personnel, protocols, procedures, they provide money to uh, all 50 states, targeted issue and state partnership grants. Has anybody ever heard of PCARN? the Pediatric Emergency Care Research Network. I don't know what DA stands for. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, but an important, again, the power of all of us together in, in emer pediatric emergency research uh, far exceeds the power of one of us. Administration for Children and Families. You've maybe heard of OSEPR, kind of an interesting acronym. They work with the ACF-supported human services side of the shop to ensure that programs like Head Start, Early Childhood Development, and Child Care have support to resume their operations after a disaster. They're also very involved as ACF, uh, wouldn't necessarily call it a disaster, but a surge as we've heard over the last couple of years uh, with unaccompanied minor children on the southwestern border of the United States. ACF and the Office of Refugee Resettlement have a major role in bringing those people in safely into the system to make sure that they transition well. So that's an HHS program and we certainly supported them when the numbers got extremely high. A couple of years ago, we deployed HHS medical teams and public health service medical teams down to the southwestern border to work with Border Patrol, to work with ORR and ACF to make sure that those kids that are coming across had appropriate medical screening, treatment for everything that they needed, uh, and behavioral health screening. Lastly, CDC, FDA, and NIH, and I, you know, no disrespect for lumping them all together because these are major operating divisions of, of HHS and these are big, 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 big programs. But the reason I'm mentioning them here is because they really, when you think about it from the pediatric perspective, they have a critical role in ensuring that kids have access to the life-saving therapeutics they need during a disaster. Um, and medical countermeasures is one of the big things that we talk about when we talk about CDC, FDA, and NIH. Worth knowing, so you've heard the words, FDA has the authority to use, uh, to deploy what are called emergency use authorizations, use authorizations to facilitate the availability of products during public health emergencies that might not otherwise be available. One of the other major areas that these folks engage is PrEP Act liability coverage. So we get into a major situation where we need to think differently about how we're handing out medical countermeasures PrEP can absorb, among other things, some of the liability from us as clinicians uh, doing that work to encourage maximum engagement and buy-in on that. The CDC, as you know, is a major responder to all things infectious disease. Uh, so think about Ebola, H1N1, Zika, and the major role that CDC's played. So they're the key role as a trusted messenger. So they're the one pushing out the emergency communications, like the HANs, you probably have heard and seen those, the health alert notices. They also provide consultation tools and research. So the EIS, Epidemic Intelligence Service, worth looking at if this kind of stuff excites you. Uh, somebody who's finished residency would be a neat person to apply to that. Go down and spend a little time as a disease detective, frontline, very interesting stuff, working epi aids a request to the CDC for services and uh, assistance at the state level. The other thing I didn't put on there is the CDC also manages the strategic national stock stockpile, which is a very large, uh, not often discussed about details of what it is and where it is for security reasons, but the ability to bring large amounts of medical equipment, things like ventilators, antibiotics, PPE, stuff that you might need in great quantity in a disaster, and they can get that very quickly to anywhere in the United States or the territories. So very important resource. Um, as an example, an emergency use authorization, this is just what one looks like. This just happens to be for an auto injector for atropine for children. Um, because of much of what you do in medicine for around disasters, is much of like what we do in general pediatrics all the time, off-label use, right? So we sort of feel pretty comfortable in what we do for off-label use. As the government, we can't do stuff that's off-label. Uh, so we can't decide to stockpile a medicine that's intended for a use that's not approved by the FDA as the government. So the way we engage that is through an emergency use, authoriz use authorization. They'll say, sure, this product can be approved under specific circumstances, under certain conditions, if it's in the public health best interest to public interest to deploy so to save lives. And that's things like medical countermeasures, post exposure prophylaxis, things like doxycycline, where we're using it in a way that we don't normally use it and it's not necessarily on label, but we might want to say buy a lot of it and have it available in case we needed it, we have to have an emergency use authorization in place. This is an example of a health alert notice. Uh, we get these all the time. Hopefully you get them, you can sign up for them. Your hospital probably pushes them to you as well if you're a clinical person. But 
things like uh, testing for Zika or looking for Ebola cases, that type of thing. This is sort of an example of products that the FDA works on. So, hey, you got doxycycline and it's all tablets because it's cheaper and easier and safer to store tablets. But how do you get them into a kid? Because they're not going to take your doxycycline tablet. And if we had time, one of my favorite activities to do is to break out a bunch of doxycycline tablets and chocolate syrup and make you guys uh, create oral suspensions of doxycycline. It's fun and interesting. Uh, so off, the Office of the Secretary is also very important in that they have uh, the Secretary has got broad authority to be able to declare public health emergencies. doesn't have to be in conjunction, but often is with a presidential declaration of a Stafford Act or a uh, national emergency. This allows the Secretary to activate things like the NDMS and to waive regulations, what are called 1135 waivers of the Social Security Act, that allows you to change process to provide more efficient patient care. You could tweak MTAL a little bit to make it more flexible, uh, that type of thing. I want to acknowledge the Department of Defense and the U.S. Uh, Agency for International Development. USAID is essentially FEMA for all disasters happening everywhere else, and they are super busy. About 70 disasters per year that they manage. You'll hear the word DART teams. These are the management teams that go out for the major disasters, but there's also lots of activity happening around the DART teams. And I have to acknowledge the Department of Defense because look at just the last couple of weeks, the, what partnership we have with them now to be able to, number one, transport responders, use high water vehicles, uh, build air bridges between the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, and you know, helping now trying to figure out how do we build a better logistics chain so we can really uh, start uh, seeing full speed ahead in Puerto Rico. The, the logistics of working in a remote environment like that, Haiti, Puerto Rico, where it's out in the middle of the ocean, and the airports and the ports have been affected, is logistically one of the more challenging things you can do in our business. I want to acknowledge the non-governmental partnerships. You guys heard about AAP last year, but we work closely with AAP, Red Cross. AAP does tons of products looking at how do we better care for children in disasters. So uh, I want to land on time here. I was hoping to have some time for questions, but I tend to be really long-winded. So. Uh, Hopefully what I've been able to, to show you is the progress is being made. We haven't quite visualized 100% success yet. Significant challenges remain, but we're all doing this together. The takeaway I want you to have is disasters are always going to be a local emergency first. We are in support of you guys as the local resources of the community. So state and federal governments are typically in support of. Um, some of the challenges, we've had a poor uptake in the need for personal preparedness despite the last 20 years. I'm going to change that. Uh, and I said see preparedness month because no matter how hard we try and hammer the need to be prepared as individuals. We as Americans feel very comfortable saying, do a terrible job at this. And uh, we've looked at this, and I did this in my uh, academic life before I was a Fed, and have kept in touch with the surveys and the numbers afterwards. Even despite Hurricane Katrina, 9-11, Superstorm Sandy, the baseline of preparedness in the United States, meaning people who have taken even the most minimal steps towards stockpiling enough water for a couple days, maybe getting a couple extra days of prescription, talking to your kid's school, it's really low, and it really hasn't moved very much. And you go into places like New York City, and it's even lower than the national average uh, in places where maybe it should be higher. So one of the huge challenges, and that Joel's going to fix that, uh, you know, trying to, trying to figure out innovative ways to increase preparedness. And you've seen lots of different advertising campaigns and have a plan, get a kit, be prepared. It's all great in concept, but the problem is the same 35 people out of 100 have already done that. Uh, so we need to figure out how to access the rest of them. And uh, we, we could have a whole nother grand rounds on uh, trying to engage the unengaged in that realm. Uh, it's, it's a nut that's really tough to crack. Um, Inconsistent engagement across the board on the need for a strong baseline in peace preparedness. So we get it as children's facilities, you get it as children's national, but this may not be your top priority if you go out in the middle of the California desert and it's a general hospital that's trying to operate in a for-profit uh, environment. And I'm channeling uh, Dr. Anderson's disaster of one concept, which is, you know, again, you need to be able to do this stuff on a day-to-day -day basis before you can even really start talking about doing it during a disaster. Uh, and that's a one-hour talk condensed down into five seconds. But uh, it's a really important concept because although we get it, we forget that not everybody does get it. Um, and then I really want to emphasize thinking about coalitions. I mentioned coalitions during the reference to the hospital preparedness program. We're realizing that, that preparedness for a low probability, high consequence event is expensive, it's onerous, um, but it can be done if you share the load a little bit. And uh, I think as I Got my slides out of order a little bit here, but uh, when, when you look at how we practice pediatrics in the United States, we've already gotten pretty far down that line compared to some of the other areas of medicine because we already sort of do this regional approach, this coalition approach towards providing 
pediatric health care and pediatric specialty and emergency care to the community. We, we don't necessarily do it the same way that some of the adult care colleagues do, where it tends to sometimes be more hospital-centric and you're competing for patients. So think about what positions we can leverage from. I want to, in the short two minutes I have left, really acknowledge the medical reserve cord that you guys have here through Children's National and the opportunity that that represents. Uh, very, very important. There are quarter quarter million uh, medical reserve corps volunteers across the United States that are organized into many, many hundreds of teams that really stand ready to support in a whole range of different ways. Children's obviously has a pediatric specialty team that can provide consultation and advice and operations to support uh, a bigger a bigger mission. And just, I understand you've done that several times through inaugurations and holiday support and things like that. Um, NDMS is sort of an interesting opportunity. Uh, there's, we haven't hired a lot of people in the last couple of years, uh, but I think as we get into a new administration and move forward, uh, I think that program will redefine itself a little bit as we look big picture at the role of ASPR supporting uh, catastrophic care in the United States. So keep an eye on that program. And, and way forward, I hope I shared what I see as the government's perspective role as a hand-holding partner in you guys as the locals for how do we all advance this ASPR preparedness I already hit this point that pediatric providers are so well positioned to provide a critical role in advancing this type of stuff. So this is the regional approach we already talked about. The other stuff's really important. We're already talking with families. We already have a trusted relationship to share this kind of message. So uh, anticipatory guidance doesn't just have to be poisoning prevention. You can talk to your patients about uh, disaster preparedness. Do you have a plan? You know, what are you going to do if your kid's school shuts? You know, you know, when you see when you see that kid coming in before they go to school for the year, maybe that's an opportunity to just you know, take 10 seconds and talk to them about that. Patients do stuff because we as the doctors tell them it's important all the time. So preparedness is really, really hard to sell, especially for us. You know, we don't necessarily as a group of providers do a great job at making sure our whole family is taken care of with water and resources and food and that type of thing. But it's important for our patients to get this messaging. And I sort of make the reference to smoking here. Smoking cessation is hard, but yet we still do it. We hammer that nail you know, as hard as we can because we know that we as doctors and providers have a role in making, making families, helping families make healthy choices, big picture. And then last bullet is just make sure you're taking care of yourself. This is something I've certainly seen in the last couple of weeks having, having deployment down to Florida and for the hurricanes. It's, it's really easy to destroy yourself in the heat of the moment. Uh, preparedness can ease some of that by making sure that you know your family's taken care of. So if you don't make it home for say 11 days, that, uh, that everyone else still has enough food, water, access to cash, that type of thing. So preparedness can ease some of the strain on you as a provider afterwards, because I promise we get into a big disaster, the normal work schedule thing is going to go out the window. People are going to be doing extraordinary heroic things, and that, uh, that takes a toll, and have certainly seen that in the last couple of weeks. So thank you for your time. I know I really pushed the boundaries of being able to do questions and answers. Some interesting photos from the past. Acknowledge Michael Shannon, who we've lost uh, in the business, but this was to remind me to talk about the innovative opportunities we have as children's centers of excellence like we have here. This was Boston Children's Hospital's work on looking at practical preparedness for doing patient decontamination. So you got an adult hospital here, child hospital here. Are we really going to drop all the kids off for decontamination here and have all the adults go down the street? Never going to happen. So children's hospitals need to know what to do with the adults. Adult hospitals need to know what to do with the children. He was a pioneer in how do you set this up and share uh, best practices, and there's videotapes available through uh, uh, HRSA to be able to, to share some of those experiences. And then just my parting shot because it's important. <laughs> so thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I promised I'd go over and I you kept did. through the words. <laughs> So thank you, Dr. Garrett, for sharing all of this information. I know many of you probably have questions. Please feel free to come up to the podium to ask a few questions. He has a little bit of time with us. I also know that we're high census and you guys have to go back and take care of our patients on the floor. So thank you again for coming. Thanks for your time. That's awesome. Is it okay? Great, this is great, great. In fact, uh, Caleb was just saying, oh,